Um, yes, of course, like all of our speakers, um, except Sandra and myself and Max that you saw earlier on the stage traveled, of course, especially to be at this event. And it's, uh, I think, really fantastic. I think also the connections between the conversations we're having are becoming apparent. And, um, and I hope this is going to be also a point that all of you who are not yet members of GIG, uh, that you maybe want to connect with our community further beyond this event. So if you're not yet a member and you're interested in learning more about us and seeing how to connect, please approach any, any one of us <laughs> you've seen on stage as members or want to to identify themselves, otherwise uh, off stage as well, uh, come and talk to the team. Um, maybe we can have a quick raise of hands, Fadia, Chaima, Sandra, Kirsten. So we're all around in case you want to learn more about our gig after we get off stage as well. With that, I would like to continue with the next panel discussion. And as was already announced, we're now going to talk about how different kinds of innovation spaces, innovators and makers can make a contribution to crisis response. And I want to get our panelists and start the conversation on stage right away. So please allow me to introduce them to you, our four fabulous people who will join me. You already got a small sneak peek earlier of Emilio Velas. He is the executive director of the Apropedia Foundation, which has a special focus on sustainability, international development. And um, yeah, and Emilio has um, worked in those different areas and connecting those different areas with the aim of creating more traction around open movements and social impact. He is also the chapter lead of Creative Commons in El Salvador, where he is based and a board member of the Internet Society El Salvador as well. It's fantastic to have you here, Emilio, and fantastic to have you part of this gig. Please give him a big, there you are, big round of applause. Come on stage. I would also like to have a huge applause, please, for Charlotte Kigezo. She is a mental wellness advocate. One moment. <laughs> She's a mental wellness advocate and somebody who really, the moment we met in Nakuru when we had the gig event there together with Rogue that was mentioned earlier, which was wonderfully organized by Vicky, um, I was just in awe of Charlotte's work. She is a psychologist, a spoken word artist, and does really fundamental work at Platform Africa, which is an innovation space located in the refugee camp, Rhino camp. And um, yeah, she's obviously supporting mental health work there, has focused also on different uh, vulnerable groups, sexual minorities in her work, um, and, and assists the community in Rhino camp, but also other communities with her work. It's so really fantastic that you made it all the way to Berlin. And please, huge welcome on stage. Big round of applause, please, for Azi Swadi, who's been working uh, for a number of years now in the humanitarian aid field. He has been working at Field Ready and is now also working with GIG on the Tolokar project. And it's fantastic to have you here. Welcome on the stage, Aziz. And finally, I'm so sorry, there's one person I haven't been able to greet off stage yet, but I'm thrilled that you're here as well. Konstantin Leoneko has been involved in Fab Lab movement for over 13 years now. Konstantin has launched numerous labs in the Ukraine and United Kingdom and is also connected to the Tolokar project. It's really great to have you all here. I'm really excited about this conversation. Um, you are all working in different ways to support communities that have been affected by crises and you are providing spaces for them and you are giving them access, access to your expertise, access to community members, access to in some cases, machines, when it's about access to fab labs, maker spaces, etc. So in a first round, I really want to welcome you to share more about your work and how you are doing this with your different communities. Maybe we'll start on the far end of the panel with you, Constantine. Some of you have also brought some um, pictures for us to look at. So um, if you want those shown, yeah. then uh, the uh, wonderful <laughs> Philippe from Tech Support will help us show them. Constantine, it's really great to have you here. Thank of course, you, as I said, you're from Ukraine, and the crisis that people in your country are affected for is, of course, the horrible war of aggression that Russia is leading against your country. So um, this is a very stark example of how makers, maker spaces can contribute to supporting their communities in times of crisis. Can I yeah, invite you to share how you're doing that? Yes, please. Uh, OK, so that's, that's the previous version of the slides. Uh, unfortunately, I had a couple more slides in there. Is it? There's no first slide, no? Uh, there was a bit context setting. 
Uh, but okay, uh, well, uh, basically war is kind of a different, a very special kind of crisis. Uh, ah, yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, yeah, war is a very special kind of crisis uh, in a way, and uh, just kind of to make it quick, uh, Toluca project uh, is mobile makerspaces. Uh, uh, Fab Lab, like some of them, uh, they're quite different. Uh, some of them are just like normal workshops. Some of them are uh, uh, more focused towards digital fabrication. So I'll give you a quick tour of uh, how the project evolved. This is the first uh, Toloka that was on the ground operating in Ukraine already in uh, May 2022, uh, which is lightning speed uh, uh, in the humanitarian context. Uh, in uh, in big, big thanks to Vicky for making it happen. Uh, to setting the ground uh, for it and uh, being able to convince humanitarian organizations and funds to invest into uh, such infrastructure. So the first uh, CADUS uh, mobile lab was uh, uh, was used to convert a, uh, a bus into a mobile intensive care unit uh, that was uh, uh, transporting wounded soldiers from the front lines uh, to, uh, to the appropriate uh, places for care. That was the uh, the first immediate uh, response. Uh, further uh, labs, uh, further maker spaces, further tolokas, uh, they were equipped more with kind of uh, rebuilding renovation tools, uh, more focused towards carpentry and metal work. So they were used to help develop this kind of uh, renovate spaces for internally displaced people to build furniture. Uh, uh, they can see the the designer uh, and uh, yeah uh, further other maker spaces were uh, mobilizing themselves to just create uh, again facilitate internally displaced uh, people and families and this is an example of kids playground that was developed by uh, one of uh, one of my previous colleagues from uh, from Donetsk uh, some more uh, quick and uh, but not dirty, uh, and very clean uh, furniture designs. All of this stuff was made with so much love and care uh, that no mass-produced objects and no mass-produced uh, solutions could, uh, could facilitate. Uh, then the third round of Tolokas, uh, when I joined the project already, uh, was already focused much more on digital fabrication. And here's us uh, teaching a 3D modeling and 3D printing class uh, during a complete blackout, we were running off the uh, of the batteries that uh, Tolokas have. Uh, Here is a workshop that we were doing uh, to recycle vape batteries into uh, emergency lights. Uh, Here is one interesting solution uh, that was sourced from the network. About uh, uh, it's it's a very low cost, uh, quick design for building. Uh, insulated uh, windows. Basically, it's uh, uh, plastic foil, PVC pipes, and it makes a triple chamber insulated window that can be installed in 15 minutes uh, and made to any size. Uh, we've been doing consultancy workshops to uh, help develop new labs. Uh, so there on the left, you can see uh, space in one of the schools, uh, and on the right is this space. Uh, a couple of months later, turned into a complete new lab. Uh, we've been doing replication workshops uh, so that kids build their own 3D printers, uh, printing. This is uh, a little bit going into heritage work uh, and uh, kind of bringing the uh, Ukrainian music making heritage into the digital age so that uh, these are uh, made by famous Ukrainian uh, luthier and wind instrument maker. Read maker, I think, is the key word. Yay, Vicky. Uh, uh, so that they would be able to uh, to be replicated in all the the labs and schools where we where we install them. So, briefly, the idea uh, I want to try to communicate here is that how uh, the project has been adapting from immediate, urgent uh, response to slightly longer term uh, uh, longer term support to uh, much longer term vision into uh, uh, rebuilding the country. And uh, supporting the supporting the community. Yeah, that's my quick overview.
Thank you very much, Constantine. Incredible work. And um, yeah, and uh, really great that you're here to represent it for us. Aziz, maybe I can ask you to do two things at the same time, because you have been working in different contexts on crisis response, both from the place where you have been located, your place of origin, as well as in connection with the Tolokar project now. So perhaps you can share your perspective on how makerspaces, innovation spaces, these kind of approaches can support for crisis response from both these perspectives. Yes, uh, thank you. It's working? Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, so let, let me start from uh, 2018. Uh, it's, it was the time I joined this work. It was the first time I met Andrew Lab over, over Skype. And I started working with the field ready as a technical lead. So, and uh, in fact, in, I worked in many places around the world supporting like makers and supporting many projects uh, to complete. Uh, and then I had the chance to work on uh, the designing phase of Tolokar project. And now I'm working with GIG to support the Tolokar project. Uh, so, th so this is briefly me. And uh, about the, the second part of your question, uh, like through my work in field ready and also with the, the Tolo car team, uh, like the kind of response we are doing to crisis would, would raise the question about what is innovation and what is, what is the right way to respond to different crises. So like, it's not about making and printing color for stuff using the 3D printer or making some complex shape that you have to spend some time fixing using the laser cutter or something like that. So when we are thinking about response, we are thinking about the need. So the maker spaces and fab labs can be easily tailored to the need that's happening on the ground, which is the, the, the real innovation about this work. We understand the need, then we put the design, and then we can produce to fill the need. This is really important to understand because this shifts us from making things as prototyping to some kind of production. We need to produce things. It's not customized production. It's not a job production. It's not a mass production. It's specifically production for a specific need. Whenever we understand this type of production and this type of work, then we can be innovative to the crisis that happens on the ground. In fact, the approach that maker spaces and fab labs provide, which is the flexible approach and the openness, can make it easy for people to respond locally to, the, to their needs. And when we say locally, it's, it should be connected to the local needs. It should be understood by how people understand their needs and what is really needed on the ground. Then we can change our production plan, change our thoughts, change our designs to the need that exists on the ground. Uh, so I, I think this is the most important concept and uh, idea about how maker spaces can contribute to crisis response. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, you may applaud for all this fantastic work being done. Charlotte, like I said, the minute I met you, I was so incredibly impressed with the work that you do. And I thought like, oh, this makes so much sense. Every space should have a person of your skill set and your qualification. And of course, in the like every maker space, every innovation space. And some of the conversations that we had in Nakuru really made me uh, understand so many layers of why this would be useful, supporting entrepreneurs and their struggles whilst they're bootstrapping and frustrated with their companies not working out, or people who feel lonely sometimes because we're innovators and makers in a world that, uh, as was said earlier, has so many complexities and bureaucracies and things you need to deal with. But you have a very special setting also that you're in. And anyway, I'm talking too long now. I want to let you share, of course, how... How, what does your work look like at Rhino Camp? Maybe you can let us in and share a little bit. Hello. Hello. I'm an energy bomb. It's, it's on my CV. So whenever, it's on LinkedIn. Apparently LinkedIn is our new CV now. Um, so I, I, I work within, the work I do currently is 
we started, and this was under ROG agency, AskNet, the AskNet project, where we sat down and noticed there are not enough therapists or psychologists in the world in the refugee camps. So what can we do to fill that gap? I think a little background is that you, I think we've noticed all of us are talking about open, open space, open culture, creation, but none of us are talking about mental health. None, none of us are talking about mental well-being. Um, I remember Andrew was here. Yeah, and mention was it Andrew? If I got it right, yeah, burnout. And and my question was then how do we deal with burnout? You're the ones helping other people who need help. Most of us are, are working in very critical spaces. It's either a war zone. It's either a, a place with tough rules or regulations. It's it's someone oppressing someone. How how are we taking care of? other people that need care? How are we filling our cups in order to fill other people's cups? So we created something within the refugee space that we called uh, Trainers of Trainers, where we just community mental health response. Because while you're teaching young boys and girls or young people about computers, the person is traumatized. So how is that knowledge going to sit in? While you're talking to young girls about technology, they have very low self-esteem because they've been taught technologies for boys. So how, how are you allowing that young girl to feel comfortable within that creation space? And that's what we started doing with uh, ROG Agency, AskNet, then GIG. And what we have been doing is simply creating spaces where you can allow these community members to feel human enough, I'm human enough to see that the work they're doing is valuable. Because you can't tell me I'm a refugee who is in a foreign country, you're teaching me computers, but I have to first go home and deal with the war. Unfortunately, we know what South Sudan is like right now. Things haven't really changed. No one should lie to you. Uh, read the internet, of course, sources that make sense. Things haven't really changed, yeah? They still war. I still have to go home. And with all my computer, I have to remind my father that I can't get married right now because I want this to happen. Those are still cultural things that are happening. And it's not just Africa. I like how people <laughs> limit it to the no. These are cultural things that are all over the world. You're a young girl by the age of 15. Right now, at least we 20. You should be married. But how is my mental health catered for, for me to feel human enough to do those things? And that's what we started doing. Creating spaces in which refugees felt like humans. Not humans who are from war. Not humans who, have a, who don't have a home. Not hum no, human beings beyond everything else, I'm a human being. And we started, I think, um, if you've read uh, Rogue and uh, Defy Hate Now, there's the, they have the, uh, where am I forgetting? The field guide. And in 2018, I was able to contribute to the field guide where we had a sector on trauma healing information that we can share out. How can you use storytelling for trauma healing? Everyone who came on this stage was telling a story. How can you use those stories for trauma healing? How can you use spaces where people are creating as spaces for conversation and healing? How can I be building a 3D printer while having healing conversations? So while we think about technology, Psychology is important. Your psyche is what holds all the technology, all the algorithms, all the mathematics. Your psyche, psyche is mind, psyche is brain, is what holds all that. So at the end of the day, if your mind is filled with mathematics, where do you get time to tell yourself, I care about myself, I love myself, in order to tell that child, that refugee child that you're going to train, I care about you, you matter. So that's how we came in. As theoretical as it seems, but we extend a hand and through that we've created trainers of trainings, just, or trainings of trainers, sorry, where we, I teach community peer-to-peer -peer counseling. Peer-to-peer -peer counseling is just basic small counseling of how we can create space to listen to each other. It doesn't do anything, it doesn't heal any disorders, it doesn't treat anything. It just creates a space to be heard, to be listened to, and to be understood. With that, we were able to extend the training past just healing and trauma into creating inclusive spaces for open culture, 
training and creation, yes? So this means how I think most of us have walked into rooms and it's full of boys. But girls know how to fix things too. Girls want to fix things too. We want to repair things too, yeah? So we started, and I remember when Steve told me we're going to do a training. Um, we called it the Feminist Cafe. I think we have a cafe, you people shall attend. But we, we called it the Feminist Cafe for the mere fact that for a long time, any time we would train, the list we had was boys. Any time we'd do a call out, it was boys. Guess what the first class for that training was? Self-esteem. I, I know, like how do you teach self-esteem? You teach acceptance and then the person learns self-esteem. So our very first training was a very long questionnaire me asking girls about themselves. Let me tell you, I've never seen a, a bunch of confused people like that. When you ask someone something as simple as, what do you love about yourself? And that was a tough question to answer. But that's how you start self-esteem. That's how you allow a person to recognize their existence. Because most times, everything we know about ourselves, we've heard from someone. So for yourself, what do you know about yourself? And with the continuation of that, we now have a very long list of young girls wanting to join repair. Young girls doing repair. Why? Because we started by allowing them to recognize that they are human beings. That is literally what my work is. Allowing people to notice that they are human, and in the humanness, they can contribute to open culture in the humanness that they are. Thank you so much, Charlotte. I think it's really obvious without commenting, but I'm going to comment anyway, how profound this work is for and with people, communities who have lost everything, left so much behind to be able to see themselves this way. And thank you so much for explaining this super important concept of open culture, which kind of goes hand in hand with the concepts that we're sharing about open technology today as well. Emilio, um, I'm so glad to have you back on stage. Um, I hope this isn't a horrible thing to say, but some countries or some regions have temporary moments of crisis. Other countries seem to exist in a permanent kind of crisis. And, and I think in the society that you're based in and you're also working with, there are many of convert, like we're talking now so much about converging crises as, as well. So whether it's about safety issues, about um, climate issues, um, so many things to address at the same time. So can you share a little bit about the work and how you're doing it um, that you're representing today? Yes. Can I ask for the quick Yeah, uh, so I, I, as I mentioned before, I work for Apropedia, uh, but for many years I, I started working on international development and lots of that work had to do with uh, uh, disaster response and relief, uh, volunteer work, and then that crossed paths with technology, the open movement. So I bring in a little of both, um, and I... Um, I did some work on mesh networks communications in El Salvador, uh, and then game design for natural disasters. Then, for then we did it for violence prevention. Um, so I, I got a little bit of different areas of work, uh, and I wanted to share a few ideas on the things that we learned. Uh, all the people in the group uh, of makers that work together. Uh, were similar in the sense that we all had done community work before being makers. And first idea, I have three. Uh, the first one is there's a heavy burden on being reliable on the things that we're creating. Uh, and that is something that we have to think about because these are people's lives that we're uh, thinking of saving. And there's always the savior complex that can just come in with being a maker, right? Uh, we found that the, the moment of crisis is not necessarily the moment to test whether things work or not. Um, and, you know, the, we have to think of these things before. Uh, the disaster response, for example, has many different aspects, prevention, uh, mitigation, uh, so the crisis can be a moment for people who are prepared to do that work. And there can be makers doing that, but there has to be preparation. Um, and I have this example. Uh, 
it, they used to be videos, but uh, we were doing this workshop in a community called Atonal, and at the same time, there was heavy rain, right? And we were in a safe community center, but we, I took the video of the two spaces because we were thinking, oh, you know, they might be thinking their houses can be flooding, you know? Uh, so you're, you're doing some sort of work. Oh, let's do this workshop. Let's co-create. And then people have real things to think about, right? They have their families, they have, um, and they're giving you their time. Uh, and in our work, we always thought of that. Uh, uh, so there are moments where we have really good ideas and good ideas take time to develop sometimes. Uh, and if we can do that, if we can take that time, uh, it's important to do it. But it's also important to get the funding to do the, the, these projects before the crisis comes, right? And to have them ready. So that's a, a call for people who want to fund these projects to not wait for the crisis to arrive. Um, and then this is another one, uh, you know, we made some designs that were ugly <laughs> and they were probably going to break uh, in a moment of crisis, right? But then there's moments to do diagnostics, to teach skills uh, for technology to different groups, and uh, yeah. Uh, then secondly, that it's not only about the technical, and it's important to think about the social dynamics. Lots of the work that we did um, had to do with families that had day jobs, and they were super tired after work coming in to work with us because they believed in our work. And we were uh, working with uh, different groups in communities. And it happens after natural disasters that there are people who say, no, we're not going to trust the government or the municipality. We're going to do our own thing. Uh, and maybe we're being funded by the government or the municipality. So how do we deal? We enter these spaces where there are all these dynamics um, and we have to be smart about how we do it and we have to be professional, right? So I think that makes us that work in crisis have to learn about all this area of work. Um, and yeah, to be mindful that the things that we are teaching are not only technical skills. They have to be life skills and they have to address the concerns that come with the crisis. Uh, some, in some cases, some of the technological projects that we had in mind had some underlying, uh, you know, th things that people could learn about how to assemble. Um, for example, in, in this image here, we're designing, we designed the game, we threw away all technology and we designed a, a card game for people to co-design uh, emergency kits. Right, uh, and this this kit actually uh, was reused by Public Lab, and I think funding from National Geographic was given to people in Texas. So it, it just grew from a very simple idea that came from uh, a game that used technology before, and. And yeah, and you know, we used to do, so the, the, the kinds of things that we did in this project specifically, which is the Labs for Resilience, uh, which was a project funded by USAID in San Salvador. Uh, we went to these urban communities. We uh, set up maker spaces and we would teach, for example, the kids uh, electronics using Arduino programming and then the older people. Um, we would teach them uh, resilience, uh, monitoring disaster response, and then we would bring them together to work. Uh, we found at one point of the workshop, that, of the project, that uh, the older generation and the younger generation were having some uh, misconceptions about the work that they were doing, so we would create workshops where they would work together and use technology or technology design as ways of creating uh, a better context, right? So we, we, we were using technology more as a catalyzer for um, better community response. And then finally, uh, focusing on know-how. In many cases, what we bring into the community after the project leaves, after the funding leaves, has to um, translate into something usable. So this is one example of a, one of the labs that we set up. This was like 
I don't know, uh, uh, Lord of the Flies uh, uh, case where children took over the community center because the adults didn't want to be part of any work. So we had lots of 16, 17 year old kids who were doing the, all the workshops. Uh, so they learned about community response, electronics, programming, et cetera. Um, and we came some years ago, and we have a photo with Andrew who, Lam, who came uh, last October, visited San Salvador, so we went there. It's not the same place. And if you see, it's like the same uh, material in a different uh, space because the, the kids got kicked out. They took the makerspace, the machines, 3D printers, everything, and they uh, asked the municipality for new space. Uh, and they set it up. They're using the machines for different things. Um, some of them are working with a local fab lab. So we don't know what will happen after we leave and after the money runs out. So we have to make sure that the know-how stays with them and be uh, able to give them the creativity to use the skills to do different things in the future. Thank you so much. I want to ask two, three questions and then open it up because um, there are many people in this room who are doing work of equal, um, yeah, like equal impact, equal approaches with their communities. It became very apparent in all your interventions how the work that you're doing co-creating crisis response with your communities is very different to the way that traditional crisis response or humanitarian aid organizations work. I'd like to learn from... All of you, whoever wants to share, how do you interface? So funding already came up as a topic, of course, but where do you see um, ways to interface in, in impactful ways with more traditional organizations, with your work? Where can it be complementary? Where can that work together? Do you want to go first? Um, so one thing is, I think I normally call Uganda a non-governmental organization uh, because the whole of Uganda is running on non-governmental organizations. <laughs> So one thing that we started doing with uh, Platform Africa is any time we had any activities with the community, we involved any government bodies. So we told them, if you're not going to send the commissioner, send an assistant. And don't send just one, send us three. And reason for that was every time we went to uh, the United Nations uh, Refugee Council, because they, they help in Uganda with that, um, and told them, we would like for you to deploy more psychologists within the refugee camps. They would tell us, uh, we don't have resources. Um, we have left that to the agencies that we have allowed to work in the camp. Uh, we don't see it as such a big need. I'm like, people who have come from war, you don't see that as a, okay. So what initially now started rippling into is that those... Um, those government bodies that were in the camp, any time an organization came up and said, we are here to offer psychological support, they would not force, but they would more like encourage them to come up with a system where their psychologists in the team were in the camp at least twice a week. Because again, Living in the camp is for the strong, uh, so th most of them would not want to stay within the camp centers. Most of these psychologists move, they're changed, they're switched, and we know when it comes to mental health, it's about trust. So we encourage them that if you're going to send psychologists within the camp, come up with a system where you maintain that information so that when a therapist leaves or a psychologist leaves, that information can be passed on to the next psychologist that has come to replace that psychologist so that you can build more sustainable and long-term support. So for us, it's been really intentional with getting government bodies on board because they are the ones who control what organizations come in or come out and literally training them and following up on objectives that we present to them. Thank you. Uh, you can... The slide? Ah, can we bring back number two, please? The third slide, please. Third one. I think you can use the clicker. Yeah, sorry. It's the same file? Yeah, okay. No? No. Where? <laughs> sorry, can you do without outside? 
there we okay. go. Um, so, okay, to answer your question, I would say the first point is to focus on the need. So this is really important because, because like, like I noticed that this could make a big difference and a big change. So the first thing we need to focus on the need and then to justify the needs and put the most important first. Like, I, I just want to briefly to, to talk about those two cases because it's really, they are really related to what you are talking about. And on the left side, it's uh, like this is from North Syria and uh, like after each airstrike, people will be trapped uh, under the debris. And like the setup of any crane, the setup of, of any heavy machine that can be used to, to remove or to lift the debris will take time and also will make more harm because usually because of the, the, the high mass of, the, of those machines will affect more on trapped people. So like we, we start thinking about what we can do and we get ourselves focused to the problem and start thinking about an innovative thing that we can do to solve this problem from local available material. And the guys and the engineers in Syria came up with this airbag which can lift up to five tons and it took something like two minutes to set it up. And in 2019, 35 persons were saved using this air, air, air rescue bag. Uh, the other example is, uh, uh, was in Lebanon after the Beirut uh, portive blast. And uh, like many people were outside their homes, they could not go back to their homes because they don't have any furniture. So it was a simple need, but it's, it was a real need. So they wanted to have furniture for their houses. So instead of like thinking about buying new furniture, instead of like starting a campaign for donating new furniture, we just went to the Fab Labs in Beirut and asking them to, can you make furniture? They said, yes. We went to the open source resource, uh, to the open source repositories and downloaded many, many designs for tables, chairs, uh, beds, closets. And within two months, we produced hundreds of farm furniture and people can, could at that time go back to their houses. So it's really important to, to stay focused to the need that is really available on the ground. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you. Um, of course, Toluca yeah. is also supported by JZ, not a classic humanitarian aid organization, but where are there, maybe in, in relation to Toluca, but also maybe you can speak a little bit generally, like where do you see these points between communities and all the aid organizations that are trying to support Ukraine? Yeah, so one of the, uh observations we had from working with a lot of different partners uh, in Ukraine was that uh, if we interact with already an established small network uh, rather than with, with individual organizations, then the, the work is uh, an order of magnitude more productive. Uh, for example, we try to find uh, uh, sort of little setups where it's not just a school, not just a university, but there would be a hospital and a university and, uh, and an NGO connected who already collaborate on some, in some shape or form. Uh, and then we give them a little boost. Uh, after that, it becomes much easier for them to attract additional funding from other sponsors. Uh, and uh, uh, it just kind of, yeah, it makes this work much more, much more lasting and much more impactful. Uh, because very often when you interact with uh, this kind of point organizations, it's very difficult for them to keep the momentum going uh, due to their own kind of internal administrative regulations or people being overloaded with administrative work. Uh, but if there's, ideally there's a small local NGO involved locally, uh, kind of tying this, uh, this small network together, then uh, we have seen already several times that this becomes much more productive. Thank you. And your experience? I think uh, the, the main disconnect between what happens up there and down here is that uh, we makers are used to testing and prototyping, right? And uh, we do gain the trust of the people that we are working with in crisis response because they see our work and they understand that we spend time with them. So it's similar to what happens uh, in field work, in nonprofits, or in humanitarian work, then you have to go and explain your funder whether what you did, you know, why you did it this way, why did you change half halfway, etc. Um, 
And, you know, just putting my Apropedia hat. A good way to do it is documenting well and showcasing your work well. And that is something that uh, us makers don't really want to do because it's so much work. Uh, but it's important to show people outside of the field, uh, you know, why things were done the way that they were done and the process and, the, you know, like uh, the... There's a lot. There, there's a lot of um, evolution of the work uh, that people can vouch for. Uh, people in communities, people who are uh, suffering these crises. So it's important to uh, you know become partners with the people that you're working with in showing this, uh, showcasing the results of the work, so that more funding can come, so that support can continue happening. I, like I said, do want to open it up before we close things up from the panel. There's so many more directions we could take this in. This is, like I said earlier, such profound work being done. And I think these connection points, um, yeah, are becoming like, you know, you're acting as uh, sort of the glue, making sure the communities can stay communities in these times of crisis, but also as these connection points that Andrew was talking about earlier in his keynote as well. So, um, yeah, so many important work in many different ways. Like I said, there are many people in the room that I know are also doing such important work. I mean, Science Camp has been basically a history of crisis response in many ways, and also multiple crises at, at the same time, dealing with the incredible temperatures in Basra and climate change, as well as a war and conflict-ridden society. Um, so I definitely want uh, to have Naris feel included in this discussion here with the amazing work that he's been doing there. Is there anybody, would you like to, is there anybody else who wants to comment or make a question for the panel? Do you want to add something? Okay. Actually, thank you for mentioning that. <laughs> yes. Uh, I just want to comment or add about that uh, in one word, and we can also explain it. It's the the commitment. It is a type of feeling we feel towards the world or the people may need or the situation as humans. And we think that we have the energy, the knowledge, the ability to provide solution for that reason. We cannot stop, just we want to introduce a solution. In our case, mainly it's about a very technical, when you see it, you find a lot of innovation in technical and STEM, but actually in deep it is very humanitarian and about commitment about our humanity. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Um, Martin, wonderful. Um, I'm Ricardo, could you, and Vicky, could you help with the microphone again? Don't worry. Martin. Oh, Marty. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I'm so happy with the work, with the work you are doing. <laughs> I can't hear myself. <laughs> so I'm so happy with the work you're doing. Um, I know there's a bit of um, sustainability which you've talked about, but I would really want you to talk more about it. When it comes to humanitarian work, um, a lot of beneficiaries uh, in many occasions, they fall back and wait to be helped. And uh, they really don't have any kind of energy to make their contribution towards their help. So if we are, we are looking at it as a long-term thing where you want to help, but you also want to make sure that the people you help become part and parcel of it, own it up, and proceed with it. And uh, to my sister, I also want to appreciate the kind of work you do because um, I also lean towards that direction so much. Um, and I can comfortably tell you that um, a lot of women would always want to make things. But there's a lot of stereotyping which has come with it. If you look at African women, majority of things which were made in Africa were made by women. 
look at pottery, look at weaving, look at all those other things. Uh, and then you ask yourself, why is it so difficult that they cannot get into these spaces? There's a lot of um, there's a, a lot of work which has gone into stereotyping, right from primary school to high school, where they were told that this kind of uh, lessons, these sciences, it's only there are only men who can do it. And when you are you are talking about um, low self-esteem, uh, there's a program we do with. Uh, artisans, we call them Juakali artisans. And when we got there with the mind of helping them to improve the quality of their products to match the market level, we learned that that was not even their main problem. Their main problem is self, uh, self-esteem. Right from Tibet institutions, it is a lot of people know that it is a place for um, failures. So they go there as failures. They learn their skills, which they are good at. They go outside there, they make their things, but they still see themselves as failures, including government and stakeholders, policymakers sit down, make decisions on their behalf without consulting them. Thank you. One quick thing just to add to that is that uh, another observation is that very often people who need most help, they're the least likely people to ask for it because to ask for help, you'll you have to have some resources as well. Um, also on sustainability, I think we were just having the conversation, how do you involve the community? And I think the word is, how do you allow them to know that this is their own, they own this? It's not, it's, it's not, I'm not World Food Program just giving you food without asking, do you want the food? No. And I think most of us, before we approach communities to train or do anything, we actually talk to those communities. We know them beyond what they're creating, what they're going to create, what they're, how are they going to even create it. We, I think each of us know each other here beyond just our jobs. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kigesu does an amazing job as a psychologist, but she's also bomb. I know her. She's cool, you know. And, and that's how... We, we say, as long as you allow them to own the program, you allow them to understand documentation, the work you have done, this is what you have done, this is what you have produced, in doing that, sustainability. Because think about it, we are training refugees that are from South Sudan to go back home, and it, we're not training them to do anything with Uganda. I mean, Uganda... Has seven. That's what it. You're going to go back home eventually. Yeah, eventually. Whether the country becomes peaceful or not, most of them we've seen they go home. They leave eventually. They're like, I can't stay. This doesn't feel like home. So let me just go home. Even with the gunshots and everything, it feels like home. Now it is an allowing them know that they own these things, that when they go back home, they're not there seated. What should I do with my life? They will actually remember. Oh my God. Sad taught me how to do this, yeah? Ricardo taught me how to purify water. So, ah, there's no water. I know what to do with that, you get. So in allowing, again, self-esteem, yes, you're not, you're not dumb, you're not mad. You, you have the ability, you're strong, the affirmations. When I go back home and I have those skills, of course now I have the self-esteem to walk up to my community and tell them, you know I have a way for us to purify water. You know we don't have to wait for the municipality to come and fix the pipe. I have a way for us to make water. And that's in owning things, we create spaces where people are more, yeah? I don't know what that is. I don't know which word that is, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I, a couple of years ago, I, I, I wrote a book chapter that Peter uh, edited uh, on gathering stories of the Salvadoran Civil War. During the Civil War, we studied two cases. One was uh, people who have been handicapped uh, either as fighters or they were already high handicapped who started doing uh, ceramics. And then another group of people who were refugees in the camp uh, right outside of El Salvador near Honduras. And the women at that camp started doing embroidery. And they, many of the pieces of embroidery still exist because they were sold by the UN and uh, and uh, they, what women wrote were their stories of how they flee their, uh, their homes due to the, um, the army bombing their, their towns. And one of the things that we were discussing were first, 
that uh, the work that does not feel as makey or techy enough is uh, also important and it can, should be considered as other types of making. And that making not necessarily should serve to save lives, make these technologies to you know the ultimate crisis, but also as mental health uh, activities. People need to regain their sense of identity and they do it through making. Uh, so it, it can be therapeutic. So it is important to think also of making and, and our uh, contribution as one that is more of caring than of you know saving. And that's also one check that you know as I say again, we have to check ourselves whether we have this you know idea of we're going to save through with a 3D printer, right? Mm -hmm. And it can happen. But we also have to think of how we can help people regain their sense of identity, of being productive, what they can do for the world and for themselves. Thank you very much. Um, I'll keep it super short. Um, thank you very, very much for that panel. It's um, really amazing to see all of you together on stage. and. Um, I love all of all of your works. Um, my question is uh, more of a comment. I'm gonna keep it super brief, and um, it's it's more like what Emilio just said. I would like to explore, and it, that's why I also say it now because I want to say it to the room as well. Um, I'd like to explore how we can be more intentional in utilizing making as a form of therapy, not just making as, you know, like a hidden way of therapy that we all know it does provide, and also not first you built up self esteem and then somebody can make, but connecting it like similar to art therapy maybe. I'm not an expert, but I've seen both in Uganda, in South Sudan and in Ukraine, I've, I've seen firsthand that it works and I would love to see more of it. And I just wanted to really highlight that point that I'm very happy to see you all together in this space and I hope we can talk more after. Thank you. I um, would love to have lots more time to discuss with you, but I think that's all we can manage today. I hope we can continue the discussion also in many different formats, because I think this is such an important one. The world is talking about how to prepare for even more converging crises, and I think you're the people that everybody needs to talk to to understand how to prepare for that, how we can make sure that we are you know, doing all the things in practice that people preach so often about, as in loca localization, what Peter just mentioned in his keynote earlier, making sure the communities affected are actually part of the conversation, not just part of the conversation, but with a leading seat at the table. And you are all fantastic examples of how that can work. So let's have a huge round of applause for all of you, please.